Welcome to the very first Tropy webinar. We are here to introduce you to Tropy. Obviously, that's why you're here, which is a tool designed to help you organize and describe your research photos. I'm Abby Mullen. Before we get into Tropy, I actually want to take a second to give you a little Zoom tutorial because I suspect that some or many of you have never used Zoom before or maybe have never been in a Zoom webinar before, which is actually the case for many of us on the panel here. So a few things about that. In a webinar, the hosts can't see your face or hear you. So if you are eating a PB&J right now or you are doing a science experiment with your kids, fantastic, Godspeed, first of all. And second, we'll never know. So that's totally cool. Uh, but as I said, this is also our very first experience with Zoom technology. So I hope you'll be gracious to us as well if something goes a little bit sideways. Uh, for instance, we had originally planned to live stream this on YouTube, but it turns out thanks to the permissions involved in the university licensing system, that is not gonna happen. So we are recording this and we will be posting it to YouTube later, but we're not live streaming it just at the moment. But if you miss something, don't worry, because we will be posting this recording and you'll be able to see stuff that maybe you missed this time around. Uh, also, as many of you have already figured out, in a webinar, there's not a chat function per se, but there is a Q&A, which kind of functions like a chat with the moderators, whom we will introduce momentarily. But what I'd like for you to do right now, actually, just to test out the Q&A function is if you are able and willing, it's to post in the Q&A where you're tuning in from just to get you accustomed to how the system works and what it's going to look like. So do that now. And while you're doing that, I'm going to have the team introduce themselves. As I said already, I'm Abby. I'm the principal investigator and the project manager on this project. And I am today tuning in from Centerville, Virginia. And I'm going to have the other members of the team introduce themselves and tell us where they're calling in from. So Sean, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Sean Tackett. I'm the other principal investigator, and I'm talking to you from Brussels, Belgium. Hello, um, I'm Sylvester. Uh, I'm the Tropy developer, and I'm calling in from Vienna, Austria at the moment. Hello. You're good. We can hear you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Johannes, and I'm the designer on the team, and I'm also calling from Vienna, Austria. Awesome. So well done to everybody doing the chat. You're doing fantastically. So the question is, why are we all here? Well, obviously, it's because in some ways we all have the same problem. Maybe you have a folder on your computer or external hard drive that just has tons of photographs that you don't really know what to do with. Maybe it looks something like this. Nameless, contextless, lots of random numbers. Or maybe you have something that looks like this. This is a little better. This is photos downloaded from the internet from Chronicling America. Here there's a little more information. We have uh, some sort of identifier. If you look carefully, you'll see there's a date in these. But even so, we still don't know what those are. Unless you have an eidetic memory, which I'm guessing most of you don't, you can't really remember what's important about that one newspaper issue or that one photo named IMG0049. And as a result, the lack of context and this sort of super abundance of photographs has transformed what is supposed to be a research benefit. It is really awesome that we can go into archives and take hundreds or thousands of photos in a day and thus be able to get through things much more quickly in the archives. But this benefit has sort of turned into a morass, a paralysis. You can't get beyond this. I, at least this is how I feel. I can't be alone in this. Uh, looking at a folder that just includes these hundreds or thousands of nameless photos makes me feel a little bit like I'm never ever gonna understand what's actually in those folders. What is, what is it that I even got from the archives? And so what you need is a way to describe your photos so that you know what they are. And then you need a way to organize them flexibly enough that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time 
you change your approach. And that's where Tropy comes in. We think that Tropy is the tool that you need. And for the rest of this webinar, we're going to be explaining why we think that by showing you what Tropy can do. So here's the plan. I'm going to show you a fully fleshed out Tropy project, and then we're going to start over and build one from scratch so that you can see how we got to the good parts. Along the way, if you have questions, please feel free to answer them, uh, to ask them in the Q&A. And one of our team will take a crack at it, either typing it out, the answer, or potentially will answer it live as well. So if you have a question, go ahead and just type it up in the Q&A. And then we will take a few breaks to kind of go back and see if there's questions that we need to address right away. The nature of this webinar means that it's really a demo and less hands-on than maybe if we were in person. But if you've already downloaded Tropy, I would encourage you to play along if you're able, just to kind of get a feel for some of the different things. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen with Tropy, and you can see what it looks like. Now, as I'm talking, you're going to see that hopefully you can see my screen now. And you may need to adjust your settings a little bit in order to be able to see the whole interface. Up at the top, there's a little thing that says view options. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but view options is the right thing. And you might need to change your option to fit to window because the Tropy interface might need a little bit of adjustment. So if you do fit to window, that should get you where you need to be. While you're doing that, a few facts about Tropy. First of all, uh, you already met the team, but it's important for you to know also that this is a project of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. And now, as Sean mentioned, uh, he is now at the University of Luxembourg. So we're kind of splitting our time there. It's free. It's open source, which means that if you really want to see our code, you can go look it up on GitHub. And it's desktop software. Tropy does not live in the cloud. It does not have a cloud function, and you do not need an internet connection in order to actually use Tropy. You do need one to get Tropy, but past that, you don't need an internet connection. We don't track you or anything like that. It's fully desktop. Okay, boilerplate all done. Let's get to the fun stuff. So here is our screen. This is a project, a Tropy project. All of the things I'm going to talk about today are all in the documentation, which you can find at docs.tropy.org. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you read over the documentation before you start working with Tropy. Or if you're already working with Tropy and you haven't read the docs yet, you should go do that. And go there when you hit a snag. If something is not working correctly, the documentation is your first line of defense. So start there. OK, so this is a project. Here, you can see all the stuff. Let's start here, up here in the corner. This conflict and cooperation is the project title. When you're thinking about a project, you should be thinking expansively. It is possible to move items from one project to another, but it's much easier to just keep all the related items in the same project and use our organization tools to filter out the ones that you're not using just at the moment. So this is my trophy project about my book manuscript, but it also contains items that I might use to write an article about a related topic or a blog post or something like that. So it's all in the same project. By the way, bonus points if you don't already know this to see if you can figure out what I study based on what you can see on my screen right now. See if you can figure out what my book's about. Okay, so right here, this is the project title. This big section right here in the middle, that's kind of the main part. That's called the item table. The item table includes, by default, all the items in your entire project, even if they are in a list, which we'll talk about in a second, or have a tag, which we'll talk about in a second. You can view it in a list form like this, or you can view it in a grid form like this. And we'll talk in a little bit about why you might want to do one or the other. You may notice that some of these items have a little bit different formatting than other, other uh, yeah, wow, sorry, I cannot talk all of a sudden. Some of these have different formatting or have different little icons than other ones. We'll talk more in a little bit about what those mean and how you can work with them. So over here on the left, we have lists. Lists, you can probably figure out, are ways that you can organize things. You can put things in as many lists as you want. You can have as many lists as you want. 
and you can put things in multiple lists without losing them. So everything always appears in the item table here when you're out in this main view, but you can also put them in as many lists as you want. So I could put any of these things into all of these lists and it would still appear out here. The lists are non-destructive. So if you decide you don't like the way that you organized something and you want to just delete a list, you can delete the list without any of the items actually going away in the list. They'll all still be in your project. Down underneath lists, we have tags. Tags are in some ways similar to lists. They're also non-destructive. You can tag as many things as you want. You can have as many tags as you want. And you can see in this particular project, I have a super abundance of tags. So that's this side. Now over here on the right side, we're kind of moving from organization into description. This shows you the metadata. This is our metadata pane that you've typed in for a particular item. In this case, this one down here, Dale to Catalan. And it shows you all different kinds of things that you can record about this item. We'll talk a lot more about this panel and working with metadata in a few minutes when we build our own project. Underneath that, you can see our photos pane. This obviously tells you what photos you have in an item. And you may have already figured out that means you can have more than one photo in an item. And then down below, we have our notes pane. The notes pane shows you all the notes that you've taken on a particular item. So you might be thinking, okay, how do you actually take the notes? Well, to do that, I'm gonna double click on my item right here. And that is gonna transition us into the item view. Now we're really into description. Even though in this view also organization still pops up. So, you may notice when we move to the item view that you have seen approximately one third of this view before, because this part over here, which was previously on the right, is now on the left, but it's the same thing. So the metadata pane is here, the photos pane is here, the notes pane is here, it's exactly the same. So you have a little bit of continuity between your project view and your item view. The rest of the view is where you can do more work on your individual items. So up here at the top, you can see the photo editing toolbar. This is just a way that you can work better with seeing your photos. You can zoom in, you can change the orientation and that kind of thing. Over here is our advanced toolbar where you can do some more sustained work on your items. We're going to play around with that a little more when we build our own project, don't worry. And then down here is our notes field. Here you can take notes on your photos. Just like with lists and tags, you can have as many notes as you want. And so you can really beef up your research, not just for transcription, which you can see is what I've done here, but also actually taking notes on things and writing down your own ideas. Okay, I wanna take just a minute to answer any questions that have come up so far. And I'll remind you that we haven't done anything with the mechanics of how any of this stuff works yet. So we're getting to that, but if you have questions, that we need to answer right now, I'm gonna do that. All right, so let me check on the Q&A. Okay, so I'm gonna to get to the question and I will fix my cursor. I will turn on the little annotation thing. Thank you, Brian, for that. Um, we'll talk about export in just a few minutes. Okay. Let me reshare my screen. And do that. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open a new project and we're going to build one from the ground up. This is going to, I think, answer some of the questions that have been in the chat so far. All right, so we're going to create a new project here. I'm going to call this something very profound like test, but again, think expansively. All right, so now we have this lovely blank slate. As I said at the beginning, go read the documentation. But in particular, I want you to read the documentation because the way that I'm gonna demo doing things, it's very probable that there's more than one way to do the thing that I'm doing. And I'm only gonna demonstrate one way just for ease of flow here. So this is a good example because the thing that I'm gonna demonstrate now is how to get items into Tropy but there are actually multiple ways to do that. 
So you can see, hopefully, that I've just pulled up one of my folders of nameless, contextless photos, and I want to bring them into Tropy. And in this case, I'm going to select all of them, and I'm going to drag them in. And you can watch them show up down here. All right, so I'm going to close that. So as I'm doing that, what can Tropy import? Well, it can import nearly any type of image file. So JPEG, PNG, SVG, JPEG 2000, TIFF, and even PDF. I do want to make a note about PDFs. PDFs can be a little bit tricky depending on how they're created. So if something isn't seeming to work right when you import a PDF, make sure that you check the documentation because we have a few troubleshooting tips in the documentation specifically for PDFs. Tropy reads all these files as images. So if you have OCR'd a PDF, for instance, Tropy can't currently access the OCR layer, though we do have some workarounds for things like that. Tropy does import things fairly quickly, depending on the size of the image and how many we're talking about. But if you're asking for it to import hundreds or thousands of photos at once or a number of large PDFs, it's not instantaneous. So if you're planning to do something like that, give it a little bit of time. As a side note, Tropy does not make a copy of your photos. It links to the existing photos wherever they exist on your hard drive or your cloud drive or whatever, only making a small thumbnail for use within Tropy. So nothing you do in Tropy will affect your originals. Even deleting them out of Tropy or heaven forbid, destroying your entire Tropy installation will not affect your original photos. And we'll talk in a little bit about the one way that you can still make some changes to the photos themselves. Okay, now we've brought our photos into Tropy and we wanna do some work with them right away, even without looking at the individual photos. And one of the things that I like to say at this point is that if you are taking photos in an archive, it's really important to do this step as soon as you can because all the things that you thought when you first started taking photos at 8 a.m you think, oh, you know what? I'm definitely gonna remember everything about that. You will not remember it. So the sooner you can get some of this broad metadata strokes down, the happier you'll be. Okay, so now we need to know where did these photos even come from? What are they? Well, the way that we're gonna find out is I'm actually gonna change my view to grid view here. And you can see this is one of my other handy dandy research tips that I took a photograph of the box that these photographs come from so that I can see without having to write it down anywhere else exactly what the metadata is that belongs to this thing. It's really important that you get this right and it's excessively important if you're doing this when you download things from the internet. Make sure that you get all the information recorded before you close your browser, for instance, because if you think you're not gonna be able to find something in an archives again, you're definitely not gonna be able to find something on the internet again. So make sure you get this metadata stuff down quickly. Okay, so here I'm gonna go over to last import. It's not super important for this because these are the only photos we have in here, but last import is the way that you can look at just the stuff that you just brought in. So in my other project where I've got, you know, a thousand items or whatever, I don't necessarily want to have to scroll through all the items that I have just to find the ones I just brought in. So last import is the way for me to go and find just those photos that I just imported. So here I've done that. All right, we can see here, this is all the information that I need. I happen to know, because I took these photographs, that these are from the National Archives. Everything else is right here on this label. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to look at this metadata pane. Right now it says Tropy Generic. We designed Tropy Generic with the idea that this will get you down the road of having good metadata, but it's not necessarily something that you wanna use for everything because it doesn't have all the fields that maybe you want, or it doesn't work exactly like you expect. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually switch over to Tropy Correspondence, which is another template that ships with Tropy. So you all have access to Tropy Correspondence. I happen to know that these are all correspondence because I looked at these information, this information, and also it tells me right here, these are letters sent to the Secretary of State. 
So I know already that that's what I need. All right, sorry, I forgot to turn on the little um, thingy. Is that better? We're gonna go with that. Okay, so over here in Tropy Correspondence, I can go ahead and start filling out stuff based on right here, what I have here. I'm gonna leave some of these blank for the moment and we're gonna start with just the ones that are going to apply to all of the photos because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select all of my photos. And now, I just did control A there, and now I'm gonna be able to apply this bulk metadata, this archive and collection level metadata to all of my photos in here all at once. So the first thing we're gonna do is I happen to know that these come from the National Archives. So I'm gonna put National Archives. I happen to know, based on what I can see here, the collection, that this is from a specific record group, right? I'm actually gonna make this a little bigger so you can see it better. And so I can see it better. So here, this is the records collection of the office of, and now I can't see it because it's blocking. Anyway, you get the idea. I'm not gonna type the whole thing out. And also you'll get to find out I'm a super bad typer. Okay, so here we have our box, which is correspondence, et cetera. I'm not gonna, again, I'm not gonna fill all this out just because I'm a bad typist. And we have letters sent to the Secretary of State. And again, please do as I say, and not as I do, type that whole thing out. Letter sent to the Secretary of State, June 20th, 19, or 1798 to June 14th, 1824, because otherwise you'll be sad. Okay, now notice here the rights field. The rights field has this little triangle flag here. The triangle flag means we really, really, really think you should fill that field out. We can't actually coerce you to fill it out, but it's really important that you know the rights that you have with the photos that you've taken. If you're working with an archives, there's a good chance that you had to fill out a form or sign a form that said what you're allowed to do with the things that you take. It's not a bad idea to take a photo of that, by the way. Um, if you're working with stuff online, there's probably a right statement somewhere online. And you should really pay attention to that because if you don't know, then down the line, when you come to wanting to publish something or you are asked to give something to someone else and you don't know, you could get yourself into some trouble and have to do a lot of extra work to find out that information. So write it down right now and then you'll be a much happier person. Okay, so in this case, I happen to know that these are all in the public domain because of many reasons, not least of which because they're federal documents. All right, so I've filled out public domain. Notice I've left identifier blank. That's because there's not really an identifier that goes with this, but you could find one for sure if you wanted to. But one of the things that's true about this particular record collection is that it actually has a number. You may have noticed that. It says record group 45. All national archives in the United States have a record group number. And I actually want to pull that information out and not put it just in the collection field, but in its own field. So what I'm going to do is actually make a new template that has this information in it as its own field. In order to do that, I'm going to go over here to Tropy, Preferences, and it looks a little bit different if you're working on Windows. Preferences is under Edit, I believe. And we've got some settings here. We're going to skip this settings for now. And we're going to go to Templates. So the nice thing about templates is that it can be anything you want it to be, really. One of Tropy's most powerful features is its customizable templates. So if the information you want to know about your item doesn't fit neatly into one of those standard templates, then you can edit a template or make your own completely from scratch. Now, I will say, unless you have a really good reason I don't recommend starting from scratch. I recommend copying one of the templates that exist already and just editing the fields that you care about. So in this case, we're gonna go to Tropy Correspondence because almost everything there I'm perfectly happy with, but there's a few things I wanna change. And, and you may have noticed here that I can't do anything with this. It's all grayed out. That's because this is a locked template because it ships with Tropy. It's one of our default templates. So instead of changing this template, I'm gonna make a copy right here. 
So I click copy. And now what we need to do is give it a different name. You have to have a unique name and you have to have a unique URI. The nice thing about the URI is you don't have to come up with this thing right here, this sort of randomly generated string of numbers and letters on your own. Tropia will do that for you, but you do need to change the name. So once I've done that, I'm going to click create. And now you can see all of my fields here. I can edit them. I can change the property. I can change the label. We'll talk about all of these things. So how do we get the property? The property is what shows up over here, sort of your like field name. And you can use in that property any field that exists in any metadata vocabulary that you can import into Tropy. This is a complicated issue, but for most of you, most of your stuff will work perfectly fine if you stick with the ones that are already there, which are called the Dublin core. But if you have things that you think you need a more specific type of metadata field, or you have a really specific type of vocabulary that goes along with your discipline, there's almost definitely already a metadata vocabulary out there, but you just have to go and find it. And to do this and find out more about that, again, you're not surprised. I'm going to say, read the documentation. Okay. So for now, we're just going to stick with the Dublin core stuff. All right. So I'm happy with the title. I'm happy with the author. You'll notice here with author though, the property that is being associated with this is actually creator. And I have just decided I want to call it author because that helps me understand what I'm talking about. Same thing with recipient here. Technically we're talking about a Dublin core term called audience, but to me, that means recipient for this particular template. So I'm changing the label, but I'm not changing the underlying field that this is mapping to. And if this is like way over your head and you're like, I have no idea what she's talking about. That's okay. This is complicated. And this is something that people spend their whole lives learning about metadata. So work with what you can and then go from there. Okay. So we're happy with uh, recipient. We're happy with date. We're happy with type. But one of the things I want to do here is make a quick change to this one. Because I've called this template NARA correspondence, I'm only ever going to use this template for correspondence that comes from the National Archives in the United States. So instead of leaving that blank, what I'm going to do is actually put a default value in the National Archives and Records Administration. And I'm going to click is read only. What that does is it means every time I switch to this template, that field's already going to be filled in and I can't change it unless I come back to this editor. That's nice because if you're like me and you're not a good typist, sometimes you want to make sure you get things absolutely right every single time. And in this case, that's one fewer thing that you have to make sure that you get right because it's already going to be filled in for you. Now collection is where we want to do something different instead of having just one collection, what I want to do is add a field. So I'm going to click on this little plus sign and it's going to add a field right underneath here. Okay. So just for the sake of quickness, I'm going to use description. This is probably not the best uh, field to use, but the label I'm going to put on it is record group. And now I'm going to have something that I can just put that one number in record group 45. You don't have to do anything to save this template. It automatically saves. So there's no save button or anything. When you close out of it, it's already there. All right. So I've got all of these selected still, and I'm going to go here. And now you can see we have our template for narrow correspondence and I'm going to change it to that. And you can see the things I was talking about here. We've got the archive and it's locked. So I can't click on it and it's already filled out. So here I'm going to go back and add in record group 45. And then we're good. Okay, I'm going to take just a second right now and check in on the questions and see if there's anything that we need to do. And then we will come back and start talking a little bit more about thinking about these photos as individual items. Okay, so I don't see anything here that I'm going to not answer in just a second, or there might be more questions about. So, all right, let us go back to what we were doing. 
Okay. So I'm going to change this back into list view just so we can see them all a little better. And now you can see they've all gotten this label of correspondence. That's because we had that in our NARA correspondence template. But now I want to think about what these photos actually are. And the trouble is that I happen to know that when people write letters, they do not necessarily limit themselves to one page per letter. Sometimes they even have more than one page per letter. So I need to figure out how I can think about those photos as one item, multiple pages of one item, instead of just multiple photos that are kind of disconnected from each other. So I'm going to pick as this one very randomly. I've never looked at these before, of course. Um, this one, 8428. And even though it is crooked, which we'll fix in a minute, you can see that this is one page of a two-page letter or a multi-page letter. And there is the second page. So what I want to do is actually merge these two photos into one item. And the way I'm going to do that, again, this is a situation where there's more than one way to do this. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take the second page of the letter and I'm going to drag it onto the first page. And now you can see that nothing changed about the metadata for this item, IMG8428. The only thing that changed is now, instead of one photo over here, we have two photos. And so this photo, IMG8429, took on all of the metadata that was previously associated just with IMG8428. So they're now one item. But this doesn't really get me much further into knowing what's actually in this item, right? So to do some work with this individual document, we need to look at it in the item view. And that's where we're going to go now. So I'm going to double click on that, like I said before. And here we are. Now, of course, as I already said, you can't necessarily read this letter because you don't want to go cockeyed. So we're going to take a look at some of these controls up here. Some of them you can probably figure out because you've seen them in many places on any sort of image editing thing. The first one we're going to do is rotate. So now we can actually read the letter. That's pretty helpful, right? You can also mirror this if for some reason you have something that's mirrored backwards. And of course, you can do zooming or anything like that. We're going to leave it how it is just for right now. But over here, over here in the advanced photo editing tools, which remember you get to by clicking on this little button over here, you can make a lot of changes that might help you read your document a little bit better. So you can increase the contrast, for instance, or you can decrease the contrast. You can change the hue, which sometimes gets you some pretty weird colors. That's kind of interesting. The one that I actually use the most is probably saturation. I like to turn things black and white because it just helps get things a little bit easier. You can also use sharpen, which in this case actually makes a huge difference. I think it's a lot easier to read when you use a little bit of sharpening. And then this isn't microfilm, but if you've ever used microfilm and you've come across those migraine inducing negative reels instead of the ones that are taken as positives, you might find this feature really helpful, this invert colors. Sometimes you get microfilm that looks like that and you want it to look like this. So invert colors can be really helpful. And say you did all these things and you're like, actually that did not help at all. And I don't know how to get back. You can always revert to the original and change absolutely everything. But for now, we're gonna just leave this at how it is. But let's take a look at our other photo real quick. This is actually a better example of where you really do want those tools to help you read better. Because this one, I did not do a fantastic job of taking this photo. And so I really do need a little bit of cleanup. I might want to sharpen it a little bit, which again, there you can see that really, really makes a difference. Or change it to black and white so it's a little bit easier to read. That's where you really find these photo enhancement tools really, really helpful. Now, none of these changes are being reflected in your actual photographs. So the file that is associated with this is not being changed at all. So coming very soon though, there's going to be a way probably in the next couple of weeks, our next release is going to include a way that you can save a copy of this photo with all the changes, the rotations, the changes in sharpening saturation as a separate file so that you can have those if you need them for something. Okay, so that's photo editing. What I want to do now, though, is go back to our first one here. 
And now it's time for me to fill in some of this more granular item level metadata. And there are ways that you can do this. You can do it however you want, but I would recommend that you come up with a system and stick with the system because consistency is a good thing, even within the vast amount of flexibility involved in doing Tropy. Flexibility is still a good thing. So I have a particular system, which I'm going to show you, and you don't have to keep my system, obviously, but you are welcome to come up with any system that you like. So the way that I typically do things is for correspondence anyway, I do the last name of the author to the last name of the recipient. In this case, it's Benjamin Stoddart, the Secretary of the Navy, to Timothy Pickering, the Secretary of State. And then down here in author, I do last name, comma, first name. And then in recipient, I would do the same thing. Last name, comma, first name. Timothy, his first name is Timothy. Uh, that's nice because that gives you a way to alphabetize these in a fairly standard way when you go back out to the project view. And then here in date, this is one where you should actually stick to my system. You should always do dates like this. You should always do ISO format, which is four digits of the year, two digits of the month, two digits of the day. And Tropy actually recognizes that and allows it to be rendered in a slightly more readable way. But when you click here, you can see that it's still an ISO format. So you can still search and you can still sort by those dates in a logical way. Okay, the location we're gonna leave blank for now. And all of this other stuff is good. So I'm gonna turn this off just for now. And I'm gonna pull up our notes pane. The important thing to know about notes when we start working with notes is that notes attach to the photo, they don't attach to the item. So if I take a note here on this particular document, it is not going to be attached to this one. It's only going to be attached to this one, which means that you can take multiple notes on individual photos within your item and thereby have a little bit easier time figuring out where the stuff is that you're actually talking about. So there are two things you can, well, you can actually do anything you want with notes. There are two things I do with notes. Uh, the first thing that I do with notes is I do a lot of transcription. You have absolutely no need to do transcription if that's not for you. But for me, first of all, that helps me process what's actually in the document. So that's kind of one of my ways of doing analysis. But also all of my documents are handwritten. So um, until Transcribus is ready to go, OCR is not really going to work for me. So I do lots and lots of transcription. So here you can just do all the normal transcription that you'd want to. I can't even read this, etc. Obviously, I'm not going to transcribe the whole letter here, but you get the idea. And the nice thing about that is that we have all these different tools that can help you with doing transcription or doing note taking that you might find in a document, like strike through, for instance, that shows up a lot in my documents, or overline, or underline, or bold or italic, or any of these things. So there's all these different tools. They look kind of like a Microsoft Word thing. You're familiar with all of these tools. And those are there to help you not only taking notes in a transcription sort of way, but also let's say that I want to talk about the fact that this particular, oops, um, this particular thing is about the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1799. Um, and, or it wasn't an epidemic, but the yellow fever outbreak in 1799. And so I type here yellow fever epidemic, and then I can do bullet points or whatever, et cetera. So you, you know how all that kind of stuff works. Okay, so now you can see here, I've got two different notes, but they're both attached to this same photo. So when I go here, there's just another blank note screen. Okay, now let's just say that I only care about the top part of this document, which is true, because for the moment, I only care about this part of the letter. This is a whole separate letter. So what I wanna do is I wanna actually call out that particular part. And to do that, I'm gonna go up here. Oh, I forgot to, let me turn on my little thingy bob again. Um, spotlight, there we go. 
So what I want to do is up here, instead of this tool, which is like the pointer cursor tool, I'm going to click on this little box. And this box is the selection tool. The selection tool allows me to make a selection of any portion of my document, of my photograph, and then it's going to show up down here. So I have just this one selection. And then I can actually take notes on or even change the metadata down here. I can make a whole new metadata template just for selections of this particular selection. So I can make a note down here that this is page two of the previous pages letter. And that is really, really nice, especially if you're working with big documents like a newspaper page, for instance, and you don't care about the whole newspaper, you only care about one article in the newspaper, Select selections can be a huge, huge help in being able to remember where stuff is on your page. Now, one of the things I said at the beginning when we went to the item view is that we were doing mostly description but there is one way that you can still do a little bit of organization here. And that is by using tags here on your, over here with the metadata and then the tags pane. In tags, you're tagging the whole item. And as I said before, you can have as many tags as you want. You can do them however you want. But once again, I would just personally recommend that you come up with a system and you stick to it because consistency is really important even in this moment. I use tags very flexibly. Your mileage may vary, but I have sort of three ways in which I think about tags. First of all, I like to tag for theme, which is a little bit different than I might do for a list, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I'm gonna tag this as disease. And then I also like to tag all the people that are involved in whatever document it is I'm working with. So in this case, that would be Timothy Pickering and Benjamin Stoddart. Now you sharp eyed ones of you may be noticing that here I'm not doing last name comma first name, which is how I said to do it in the metadata. That's true. And this is a slight inconsistency, but the important thing is that you do it consistent consistently within the part of the software that you're working with. So all the tags for me are always first last instead of last first. Again, that's just me being weird. Uh, the third thing that I use tags for is what I call housekeeping. Housekeeping is um, like how I keep track of what I've done with the items or what needs to be done. So as I already told you, I do a lot of transcription and it's nice for me to know which items I have already done the transcription on and which I haven't. So I actually have a tag that I call transcribed. I also have one, many of my documents are also published somewhere else. So I also have a tag in my big project, which we might go back to in a minute. Uh, that I have for published or something else like that, incomplete, something like that. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a little break here and we're going to see if there's questions that I haven't answered yet or if any of the other team members want to weigh in on something. And then we're going to go back out to Project View and talk about how we can get things together once we've done all of this individual work. So let's take a break and take a look at the questions. Anybody else on the team want to weigh in on any of these? Abby, can you just show um, in the project view on the list how you can sort by column? Oh, yes. I will do that when we get to that in just a second. Yeah. Perfect. All right, so I think the rest of these I'm going to answer at some point in the very near future. Thank you to the rest of the team who's doing awesome job keeping up with the Q&A. You're doing awesome. All right, so what I want to do is go back out to our project view and see how we can work with the photos once we've got them in to sort of a, a state where we actually know what they are. So let me do that. All right, so I'm back out in project view now. And you can see here is our item called Stoddard to Pickering. That's the one we just created. 
And you notice that before it was called IMG 8428, and so it was up here. But now because it's, this column is currently the one that is determining our sort value, right now it's at the bottom because it starts with an S. But you can always do a change of your columns anytime you like. So here, if I do date added, that's actually going to put it back where it belongs. Date added is a column that you have to add, um, but you can do that. You can read more about this in the documentation by clicking here, right clicking sort of on the top of the item tables um, column headers and finding a different metadata field. Any of the metadata fields that appear in any of your templates that you're currently using can be a header. So you can do anything like that. Let me turn on the little spotlight thing again. Okay, so now that we've got our stuff into pretty good shape, we know what's going on with this individual item. Now we want to think about it in context. We've already started doing that a little bit because we have thought about our tags, but now we want to think about how does this actually fit into my overall argument? And for that, we might want to use some lists. So to create a new list, you can right click on list, the word list, and do new list. And I am going to call this chapter one, hopefully. I also use lists in a specific way that you may not care to use, but I tend to use lists in three ways as well. One is thematic, which is similar to tags, but different. And I promise it's different in my mind. Uh, but I also use them for structure. So I have a list for each of my chapters. And remember, you can put something in more than one list. So you could have multiple lists, an item that's in multiple lists at the same time. So let's just add just for fun, one about disease. So here, in order to get our item into one of these lists, I'm going to take it and drag it in. And now you can see when I dragged it in that we have this little uh, square in the corner of the folder icon. That tells me, without having to go to the list, that this starter to Pickering is in that list. And I'm going to put it in disease as well. So now you can see when I have this one, there's nothing there. And then I click on this. And you can see that it's in both disease and in chapter one. Now, let's say that I get here and I think, um, I actually think I needed to add another tag here. And the tag that I want to add is Philadelphia. You can do that in two ways. So you can do it over here, just like we were doing previously when we were in the item view. Or you can go over here to tags and right click on it, just like we did for a list and do new tag. And I'm going to add Philadelphia here. And then I'm going to add by dragging and dropping, just like we did with lists. One of the other really cool things about tags that I love is that you can change the color of a tag so that it will show up and you can see it all the time. And I like to do this with transcribe. So I right clicked on transcribed and I'm going to go down to tag color and I'm going to change it to green. And that way, when we go out here, you can see this little marking here. That tells me without my having to go looking for it that I have transcribed starter to Pickering already. Okay, that's kind of how the organization works. When we're looking at searching, searching is a universal search. So if I type in Stoddart, I know that that is going to come up. But let's say I type in um, yellow because that's something that I put into the notes, you may remember. I put um, just in the note, I said something about yellow fever, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia. So that's drawing only from the notes, but Stoddart is drawing from the metadata. So the search works for anything. Now, what do I do when I wanna get something out of Tropy? How do I export stuff? Well, there's a few things you need to know about export. Realistically, you probably don't actually need to get stuff out of Tropy in order for it to be useful. The whole point of Tropy is that it doesn't require another piece of software in order for you to understand it. So you can back up your Tropy project just like you would back up any other file. It's actually just one file called a TPY file and it probably saved your documents if you just created one just now. 
you can keep that in a cloud drive like Dropbox or back it up with an external hard drive, just like you would back up anything else on your computer. You can back it up along with your photos, but remember that your photos are completely separate. So there's no need for you to feel like if you don't back up Tropy properly, your photos are gonna be gone. That's not gonna be true. You can even work on them collaboratively, but asynchronously using shared cloud folders. And I will let Sylvester talk about that if he wants to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but if you do wanna get something out for some reason, there's a couple ways you can do it. So I'm gonna click on our starter to Pickering item here. I'm gonna right click on it and you can see export item. And right now, all there is is JSON LD. JSON LD is uh, a metadata format in some ways. If you've never heard of JSON LD, it's probably not the right tool for you. There are a few other ways that you can export things, though. One is that we have a very nice plugin that exports from Tropy to Omeka S, which is another tool that uh, the Center for History and New Media has built. It's a web hosting platform. It's a web platform for creating virtual exhibits and things like that. And it's really, really nice. So if you're looking at using something from Tropy in a web format or sharing it on the web, then perhaps an Omeka S installation is the way you should go. And it's once you get it all set up, it's basically one click to get something from Tropy into Omeka S. We also have another plugin called the CSV export. And you can get all of these plugins, go back to preferences, and you can go to plugins, and then you can install a plugin. You have to download these from our GitHub account, which you can find everything you need to know about in our documentation. I'm not gonna show that right now. And then the last thing you can do that I actually find really helpful is you can print out items. And printing out items looks pretty cool, I think. So if you go to print, hopefully, there we go. I, I'm not gonna print it out to my actual printer because that would be weird, uh, but you can do a save as PDF. You can do print it actually to your printer, any number of things like that. And you can set up how you want those things to look. If you go to preferences, go to settings, and then down here. So you can print one photo per page. That's the default. That's all you can do right now. But you can print, if you don't care about the photos, you only care about the metadata, or you only care about the notes, you can select any of these options to give you something that really works for you. I'll tell you that I really like this feature because I like to be able to use this in class. I give these to my students. I print out a primary source document that has all the metadata there with it, and maybe even the transcription or my notes. And so then they can read the document and can see what it actually looked like, but they also know exactly where it came from without having to really look a long way. So I really like the print feature, but I'm not gonna demonstrate that right now, mostly because my printer thing is busted. Okay, so that is really it. There are lots of other features that I don't wanna talk about right now because we're getting towards the one hour mark, which is where I was hoping to hit. But I'm happy to answer questions about any of them, and I'm happy for uh, my fellow panelists to answer any of them. But the most important thing is that you really should read the documentation. Please read the documentation. That's your first step. Think of it like a recipe. Read the entire thing over once before cracking your first egg into the bowl. Then you kind of know roughly what to expect from Tropy and what you should have prepared before you begin. And then if you have problems, the place you should go next is our forums. Our forums at forums.tropy.org are where you can search for questions that people have already had. You can start a new question and our developers who are currently on this call with us will answer your question. And they're very, very good at answering questions and they will do a lot of work to make sure that everything is working properly for you. You can also follow us on Twitter at Tropy. I think a number of you already do that, that's good. That's not the place to ask tech support questions. Really, that's the forums. That's where you should ask tech support questions. But if you follow us on Twitter, you'll find out about updates, news, other cool stuff, things like that. And that's also one of the easiest ways to get hold of me personally, if you really want to talk to me for some reason. And finally, last but not least, on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter. 
it gives a gives you information about releases like I was just talking about events like this and other fun stuff like that. It's completely opt in. We will not automatically add you. We will not track you. But it's your way to maybe get some more information about Trophy without following us on Twitter if Twitter's not your thing. So what I want to do now is just open up the questions or ask uh, Sylvester or Johannes or Sean if they have um, questions they want to answer. And I'll talk about the teaching question in just a second. I think I had one question about um, selecting items that I'm a little bit confused by, but I think I'll just demonstrate that in a second. Um, okay. So um, if you want to select multiple items in Tropy, you can, if you are, if you have keyboard focus on your item list, you can easily tell that's the case if you use your up and down arrows. You can just uh, press Control or Command A to select all the items. And of course you can also use the shift or command keys to make more complicated selections. Okay, I think that was the question that I needed to answer. Um, I just want to take a quick crack at um, teaching materials. We are working on teaching materials right now. That's something that we're working on over the summer. So um, we will definitely be rolling some of that out over the summer. My suggestion would be that you subscribe to the newsletter to find out when that stuff rolls out. Um, but we are definitely working on materials like that. Um, Sean is going to talk about Zotero in just a second. Um, and yes, there will be a recording of this call, which we may edit for clarity. Hi, so I can I can talk a bit about the the question about what how Tropy interacts or will interact with Zotero. So, um, Tropy exists because Zotero was not a good solution for for photos. So, um, the it makes sense to keep these two aspects of the scholarly workflow separate. Um, in in our estimation, and so we have developed two totally different tools for these two totally different aspects of research. However, I certainly understand as a historian that, that there are often um, sources that we have uh, images of, which we like, would want to keep in Trovi, but perhaps these are books. And so we want to have a citation for them that, that would you know, use Otero to um, generate your bibliography or your, your footnotes. So um, that we understand that there's some overlap there. Uh, in terms of future integration, uh, we can certainly imagine some automated ways to put metadata to format metadata into Tropy now that a lot of that service level architecture of Zotero is no longer in the Zotero software itself, like li living on your desktop, a lot of the services moved to the cloud. So Tropy could in the future access some of that functionality and do some of that formatting. Um, and likewise, some very basic um, Citation formatting of um, trophy items is possible, but something very, very basic, not, not on, the, on a par with what you have with Zotero citation formatting. And the simple reason for that is that there are no, <laughs> no real standards for citing archival sources, or at least no standards that anyone follows. Um, so even if you take five books that follow the, Chicago, like for example, the Chicago Manual Style, um, fastidiously in their footnotes and bibliography. If you look at how they cite archival sources, they'll cite those archival sources five different ways, um, and maybe more than five different ways. So um, that's we've we've kind of given up on that, um, but we can do some some shortcuts to help out in the future. And Sylvester, would you talk a little bit about accessibility and screen reader use, or how we've tried to make Tropia as accessible as possible? 
Uh, sure, if if I can. Um, so Tropy is based on on a browser uh, platform, so it uh, basically supports similar features as as browsers, um, but we have what what. We lost you, Sylvester. I think you muted yourself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, so there are keyboard shortcuts for everything in, in Tropy. Um, screen reader support. I don't think we have um, we have any extra uh, support for screen read screen readers at the moment. Maybe Johannes um, knows more about it, but uh, I think since we since we um, work mainly with images, we didn't prioritize that. But uh, using the at least uh, macOS platform, um, using VoiceOver, it, it should work fine to use. Cool. Thanks. Um, so. Joe asks an interesting question about um, plans for a Tropy server or cloud hosted offering for teams. So there's two things to say about that. One is that you can in some ways already use Tropy in the cloud in terms of you can put your photos in the cloud and then use Tropy and Sylvester maybe can talk about or you can look on the forums, which is where there's been a lot of discussion about how to work collaboratively with Tropy. That's something that we're fully aware is something people want. And we're working on figuring out the best way to move forward with that. We're making progress, but slow progress on getting that really rolled out. Um, at the moment, we don't have plans for cloud hosted photo storage, which is, I think, maybe what you're asking. Um, but we are certainly aware that stuff in the cloud is, thing, is something that people want. So we're, we're working on it, but it's a long process. Abby, somebody in the attendees list has done used the raise hand thing. I don't actually know how that works. I don't either. So if you did raise your hand, would you type your question in the chat instead? That would be awesome. Um, OK, so just to kind of wrap up here, there's a few things that are really important about Tropy. One is that this is not meant to be the be all an end all research tool in which you can do everything from cite your secondary sources to write your entire dissertation. That's not what it's for. It's part of a research workflow. So it's meant to do something specific. It's meant to help you work with photographs that you have. And those can be anything. It doesn't have to be historical, although the team that Envision this project was all historians, so we probably have built in some historian bias into how this works, but it works with any kind of photo. So if you're a scientist or a journalist or anything like that, if you have photos that you need to keep track of, Tropy works. There's nothing preventing you from making Tropy work for you. And the flexibility that's built into Tropy allows you to use it in a lot of different ways. And depending on the project, you can have multiple different projects doing multiple different things. You don't have to use Tropy even in the same way yourself. You can have lots of different ways that which, in which you use it. But Tropy is meant to be part of the workflow. So we've built it with that in mind. And as Sean was just talking about a minute ago with Zotero, we know that people want things like Zotero to work with Tropy. We're fully aware and we're working on it. But Zotero is meant for one thing and Tropy is meant for something else, just like Omeka is meant for something else. So as you're thinking through your process, we are delighted to answer your questions and we want to hear from you about what would make Tropy work better for you in this space of your research workflow. What can we do that makes Tropy work better? And I don't say this flippantly and I don't say this uh, as just sort of a, a brush off of anyone who has ideas because many, many of the features that we talked about today were in part or in whole asked for by people who use Tropy and we built it out for them and it made Tropy a better product. So if that's you, 
fantastic. We would love for you to give us feedback on what works and what doesn't. The best place to do that is the forums. So write on the forums, forums.tropy.org, and we will see what we can do for you. And I think that is it.